I used to run distance races, and I feel a little bit like I'm on the I'm closing in on the finish today because we have made our way all the way through the book of Revelation, and we're at the very last um, bit in Revelation and chapter 22. My grandfather Pierpont uh, had a farm in Ohio, and and he would drive up through the field with me sometimes, and he would say, "Kenny, once you go over there, he'd be on his tractor. Once you go over there." pick that four-leaf clover over there. And I would get off the tractor and look, and I never could find it. He could see it from the seat of the tractor. He'd go, oh, I have to show you everything. And then he would get off the tractor and walk over, and he'd reach over to pick a four-leaf clover. And later on, I figured what he did was he had a four-leaf clover in his pocket. (laughs) So I figured that's what he did. So I was on to him. I'm like, the next time he did that, I go, let me see your pockets. And he goes, you really don't think I can, and he had this speech about how good his eyesight was. He really could find four-leaf clovers from the seat of his tractor, which is sort of interesting. When he passed in 1980, then his books, uh, he was a pastor, and he was a factory laborer and a farmer and a a bivocational pastor. And his little library passed to my dad, and and not long after that, my my dad gave me a book from my grandfather's library. It was on pastoring uh, by Andrew Blackwell. It's a big, thick, hardcover book. And he gave me that one day not too long ago. I was in my study and I was working. I pulled that book off the shelf and I realized this was the book that my grandpa always used to press the four-leaf clovers. And my hands almost trembled as I thought, oh my goodness, these are a little piece of the farm still in my hands, those Those four-leaf clovers were pressed in that book. So that book was valuable to me. It was precious to me to to a degree. But my grandfather was raised in a church that he failed to understand the gospel. And when he was a little boy, he just didn't really get a grasp on the gospel. And he kind of wandered off for a while in his life until after my father came to know the Lord. And then when my dad in the Navy came to know the Lord, he came back and gave the gospel to mom and dad. And mom got saved. And dad, my grandfather said, you know, I I know this. I have just not really been walking with the Lord. And so he came back and really began to walk with the Lord. And he became a pastor and became a witness. And when my my grandfather died in in October of 1980 and I went to the funeral, we walked up to the casket and, and there he was. And in his hands was a little New Testament. And it was there, not just the symbolism of the Bible, but because he really believed you needed to make the gospel really plain to people. Because he didn't feel like that had been really plain to him. Salvation by grace through faith and not of works. He felt like he was on a works track. He couldn't live up to that. He strayed away because he just felt like he couldn't live up to that. He didn't realize nobody had taught him plainly or he didn't understand that salvation is by grace through faith. And the works will come, but they'll come after you believe. And, and so that little testament was, he u- would use that in the factory to witness to people and to try to be a soul winner and to lead people to Christ. When he was just a little boy, though, his parents gave him a gift. I have it here with me. It's a little New Testament, um, and it was a special commemorative edition from the President of the United States. And um, the edition was from the President. He didn't give it particularly to my grandparents. But my great-great-grandparents gave this to my grandfather, it says Kenneth Pierpont, on his namesake, on December the 23rd, 1919. So this book with the four-leaf clovers in it was valuable. But my grandfather learned to have a successful life, he would want to build his life on the Word of God. And I'm going to bore you with stories about my grandparents. Oh, yes, I do. Um, my, my, other grand, my other grandfather, Shipley, he came to know the Lord and walked with the Lord a little bit later in life. And he surrounded himself with his Bibles and commentaries and his teaching because he, lo- he knew that a successful life was one that was rooted in the teaching of the Bible. So I'm very blessed to have grandfathers who found their way to God and, and who trembled at his word, that loved his word. And today, the the sermon title that's based on Revelation 22, 6 through 21, 
is this. Those are blessed who tremble at his word. Those are blessed. You are blessed who tremble at his word. Listen to this from Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. And I'll give you four passages as well as the passage we're talking about, including the passage we're talking about today. They're going to say the same thing over and over again. And you want to get this embedded in your soul because those are blessed who tremble at his word. Listen to this from Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me and what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand is made. And so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. This is the one to whom I will look. The favor, countenance, blessing of the Lord will be upon him. This is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble, contrite in spirit, and trembles at my word. Trembles at my word. What Isaiah was saying and what the, the scriptures say throughout, and it ends this way in a powerful emphasis at the end, is the one is blessed, not who dies with the Bible in his hands, but the one who lives with the Bible in his heart. And the Bible is his great north star. It's her treasure. The, the Bible people that believe what God has said are going to live blessed lives. Doesn't mean they won't have hardship. They won't have, doesn't mean they won't have heartache. The Bible never promises that. But it does promise a special favor of God, a special help from God for those who tremble at his word, who, ha, who, who esteem his word, who reverence his word. I want to appeal to you today to, to rethink this. I, I'm fresh back from camp. Um, and so that's a dangerous thing to meet a pastor who just got back in from a week of being with kids and preaching the word 10 times. I got to preach to kids, put my feet in the water, talk with kids in between. Some of our kids went to camp a couple weeks ago. Some of our campers, some of our children are going to go to camp this week. Please pray for kids when they go to camp. But one of the things at camp is what's the deal there? We want them to build their lives on the Bible because we know if they do that, they'll be blessed. And if they won't do that, they'll be cursed. And this is really what, this is the almost shocking last message of Revelation 22, 6 through 21. I want you to notice the references in this text that we just read to the book, to the prophecy, to the commandments, to the words. It refers to the Bible over and over again. And it's the words of Jesus in places where he's directly speaking the word about the word. And over and over again, the text says these words are faithful and true. I want you to notice that there are seven times in the passage these words are faithful and true. Seven times in the last chapters of Revelation, that very phrase, these words are faithful and true, is used in the last chapters of Revelation. So the big idea here isn't hard for a student of the Bible. It's emphasized by repetition. It's over and over again. It's emphasized in two ways. And this is a little Bible study tip. When you're studying the Bible and you want to get the big idea, not cherry picking what you want it to say, but what is it saying to me? What did it say to the original audience? One of the things you want to watch for is emphasis by repetition. Another thing you want to watch for is an emphasis by what I would call bracketing. When the passage starts with something and it comes back and ends with that, that's often a literary way of saying, this is the deal. So by emphasis of repetition and by emphasis of bracketing, if you will, it is very clear that the Bible ends with a passage of Scripture that talks about the Word of God and the importance of the Word of God. It actually is going to say in the sweet spot in this passage that there's a blessing promise to those who build their lives on the Bible. Now, most of you, probably you're here because that's true about you. You're like, I'm a Bible person. I believe the Bible. I'm a man that believes the Bible. I'm a woman who believes the Bible. Yes. But here's my goal today. If, you, if that's not already true about you, that it would be. That you say, well, from this day forward, I am going to build my life and spec the blessing of God on my life because I'm going to build my life but I'm, on the Bible. But I think most of you already believe that. And I think what you 
probably could use today is a refresher, a reminder, just a little more. There's an encouragement from this, this last word of the Bible, this last word of Revelation, this last word of the New Testament, the importance of God's word, the Bible. Reading through, studying the Bible, meditating on the Bible, not putting the interpretation that our culture puts on the Bible, the interpretation that you prefer on the Bible, but letting God speak for himself and trusting that what he says is true if everyone else says it isn't true. It's tr- God's word, and I'll repeat it again, is trustworthy and true. Verse 6, these words are trustworthy and true. Verse 7, behold, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. It's repeated in verse 9. Um, I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. You see the repetition here? Verse 10, he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. It's the book. It's the emphasis on the book. You by the way, this is one of the ways you can tell if you're in a good church. They make much of the book. They teach the book. They explain the book. They, they don't have, it's not their own ideas. They're always pointing to the book. And, uh, and then you have, um, again, when you get back to the end of this passage, in verse 18, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to them the plagues described in this book. This is a serious warning about, about the book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book, the prophecy, you see that, verse 19. And the very end of verse 19, the tree of life and the holy city, which are described in this book. This book is trustworthy and it is true. You, if you are old and you are discouraged by the things that overtake you in old age and the disappointments that you have and the cynicism that wants to creep in when we get older, I want to remind you to go back and keep on trusting what you trusted when you were young, the Bible. If you are young and you're trying to decide what direction to take in this life, look around at the people whose lives are genuinely successful, genuinely flourishing spiritually. What you will notice is they have a Bible nearby. They will have a well-worn Bible. They love the Bible. They study. I'm telling you, matter of fact, President Woodrow Wilson knew that. And he, he has a little essay that he put in the front of this. He said, the Bible is the word of God. Wise people will read and understand the word of God. They'll meet Christ. And the president of the United States in this little patriotic edition of the Bible that my grandfather got, he had the good sense to say, successful people that are genuinely successful, they take the word, they tremble at God's word. They have reverence for God's word. These words are faithful and true. So this is serious stuff. Question for you is, do you take the word of God seriously? Do you take the prophecies of God seriously? Do you take the prohibitions of God seriously? The promises of God seriously? Do you, re, is it just a, like, think about the way people often treat the Bible. It cracks me up sometimes when I see somebody that puts their Bible in their back window of their car, and it's up there. It's like, like it never leaves. It's like in case they ever go to church, they can get it, and the sun curls it up in the back window. I'm like, oh my goodness, I would be too proud to display my lack of devotion for everybody to see in public, you know, if it was like that. Um, th- this is um, a sad thing, but then you'll meet people often, lovely people, not perfect people, but people that you can see the grace of God upon their life. You can see the graces of God in the relationship. You can see that they're like a thoughtful husband that's trying to, to love his wife, a, a godly woman that's trying to be a godly woman or a mom or grandma, and you will notice that they love the Bible and they memorize the Bible. And they reverence the God of the Bible and they tremble at his word. So the Bible is not a collection of happy sentiments. It's not where you put your four-leaf clovers. If they're in there, take them out. It's not a good luck talisman, a good luck charm. It's not a mystically significant that way. The Bible isn't a book of suggestions. It doesn't, it doesn't present itself as a book of, of, of happy kind of suggestions and aphorisms. It presents itself quite plainly as the word of the living God, unique to every other book, not just inspiring, but inspired God breathed. It's not a, it's not one among other equal books. It's not one of the great books of the world. It doesn't contain some of the truth. 
It's inerrant, infallible. God, the Bible uses a unique language to describe the Bible. It's God-breathed, inspired. That's what we mean when we say inspired. Think about this. Sometimes people will say, Jesus isn't God. You know, people that don't believe the Bible properly, they'll say, Jesus isn't God. And then what do we say to we? They'll, they'll, we'll say, well, who do you think he is? And they'll say, well, we think he was a great teacher, a great religious leader. And then what do we say? If we're smart, we say, impossible, because a person who claimed to be God and was not is not a great religious teacher. He is a liar, a charlatan, a fake, a uh, uh, it's false. It's a false claim. He's either God. This was the famous trilemma that C.S. Lewis is famous for. He's either God or the Lord or liar or lunatic. But he died for what he believed. So apply that same logic to the Bible. People sometimes will say, well, I'm not going to say the Bible isn't from God. I'm not going to say the Bible isn't good or contains good things. I'm just, but when you say that, it's, that every bit of it is binding on my sex life, every bit of it is binding on my, the way I treat people, then I say, then, then, then I'm going to say, well, the Bible, it contains God's word or it's, it, it contains things from God, but it's not the very word of the living God. The problem with that is, if you, the Bible makes claims about itself that are so strong that if they're not true, then the rest of the thing can be discarded as well. And, and you're smart. You got that, even though I don't think I explained it all that well. You don't have the option of saying Jesus is a good teacher because he claimed to be God, and good teachers don't lie. You don't have the option of saying the Bible is a good book because the Bible claims to be a perfect book. In its original autographs, of course. And so today I want to show you from this text some things that, that I noticed in my study that I think will be encouraging and helpful to you so that you will be renewed in your desire to build your life on, on the Bible. And you got to remember, I, I'm, I'm fresh from camp. And the last thing I did, I just talked and talked and talked. And the last thing I did was I listened while all the campers got up. And they said things like, you know, the, the, the circumstances that kids come from today are amazing. And they get up and they say, I am going to have my devotions every day this week, this year. I neglected my Bible, but I'm going to get back into my Bible. I, I was in my room. I had this beautiful room overlooking the lake. It was a really gorgeous room. In the morning, I could look out, I could see campers go to these little benches on the lake with their Bibles and read their Bibles and pray. And then they would say, this week, I read my Bible every day. I think I want to do that all year long. That's why I hope that you have an experience like that today. And you'll say, I, I forgot how important that was. Yes, I renew my devotion to God by trembling at his word by studying his word, by memorizing his word, by being quiet, breathing deep, taking time in God's words when God's word Jesus speaks, who is those who are humble and contrite and tremble at God's word, he looks upon them. So what happens when you tremble at God's word? Number one, you're blessed because you will take the promises and the warnings of God seriously. When you tremble at God's word, you'll be blessed because in the, in the bottom of your, of your soul, you'll have the warnings of God and the promises of God always residing. Listen, and he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. Verse 6, the Lord God, the spirits of the prophets, has sent an angel to show his servants what will soon take place. And behold, I'm coming soon. And blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. A person who trembles at the word will take the promises of God seriously. I'm coming the warnings of God, seriously, I'm coming. This is what will happen. You, you'll know what's worthy, and I'm so glad we sang that, Thou Art Worthy. It's a gorgeous song, isn't it? Is he worthy? Is that beautiful? Oh, my goodness. Ah, beautiful song. Is he, has all revelations sweetly written into it in poetry. What, why, what do we discover when we reach the end of the Bible? We discover what's valuable at the end of all time. 
And who is valuable? What is valuable? You are worthy. It says it right there in the book. Think about that. If you're going to make an investment, wouldn't you love to make an investment in something you know is going to go up in value later? This is what you do. You invest everything in what you know is going to have high value later. And Christians know that Jesus has the highest value, that he's worthy. So, sorry, I'm yelling at you. I should, I should calm down there, shouldn't I? Sorry about that. You're like, whoa, okay, I believe, I believe. I repent, I'll come forward. Um, a, guy, a, guy, a guy worked in a garage on an early startup of a company. And in the early startup of the company, he thought that the company might have promise. And he decided he'd make a little money early on by selling the stock. He sold a 10% share of the company for $800 in the 70s, a company named after a fruit, Apple. His $800 worth of Apple stock would be worth $57 billion today. It would have been cool if he would have known what was worthy later on. But someday when we see Jesus, the one who's worthy to open the scrolls, we will like, our Apple stock will be absolutely worthless then. And the old man who lived with commentaries surrounding his recliner in a little tiny house in, in, on Otten Road in South Bend, Indiana, and went to prayer meeting every Wednesday night. Nobody really knew his name. Had a little dial indicator service on the side. Worked for Notre Dame. He's going to burst into the glory of heaven forever. Be rewarded by God forever, not because he was a perfect guy, but because he had the good sense to throw himself on the mercy of God, and he trembled at God's word. There's hope for all of us. Jesus speaks here. Fred Craddock, was a, you, you've heard me refer to him before, as an influential pastor that went to be with the Lord. Somebody asked him once, uh, he'd been to many seminaries, taught seminaries. Somebody said, who's the most, most influential teacher that you ever had? He said, oh, by all means, it was Miss Emma Sloan. They would say, when I'm the, we've never heard of her. What seminary does she teach at? Oh, he says she was a Sunday school teacher in my little church when I was growing up, and she didn't know much, so she never tried to explain the Bible to us. This is the way he put it. I love this. Because she was afraid she didn't know much, she didn't want to mess it up, she used the alphabet, and she'd just go around the room and say, A, a soft answer turns away wrath. B, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. C, come unto me, all you who are laboring and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. D, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Say it again, children. She said, she said I was afraid to teach the Bible because it wasn't that smart. So I just had the children memorize the Bible. Fred Craddock said that as an adult graduate, a seminary professor and graduate of a number of seminaries, that over and over again in his life, just at the time he was tempted, just at the time that he needed it, just at the time when he was discouraged, just at the time when he wanted to give up, he remembered Miss Emma Sloan and the Bible verse that, yes, I'm pitching for you to get involved in Awana. Yes, that's exactly what I'm doing. Why wouldn't you do that? I mean, if you can, you got the time, and you hear a little person sitting across from you sharing their verses that they memorize, and maybe they're going to memorize them because they know you're going to be waiting to hear them. And then they go off in this terrible world that we're living in, this dark world that they're living in. They're going to need to have the word of God beating in their heart. And then they remember that word. And maybe, maybe even as a bonus, your smiling face, Miss Emma Sloan. <laughs> you'll be blessed because you'll have the promises of God in your heart if you take the word seriously. Jesus says, I will come suddenly. I will come soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. There are seven benedictions in the Revelation. You would have guessed, right? Seven. Two of them are in chapter 22. They are in, they are in verse 7. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. It's like you can take that to God's bank and cash it. God, I want you to bless my life. I don't even know what I ought to want. I mean, this job I want may not be good for me. This girl I want to marry me may not be your choice, this guy. So God, I, I don't even want to want. I just want to, you to give me the right desires. You to, so I'm going to claim this promise, bless, blessing to the one who trembles at the word. That's the best advice I could give you. That's the big idea of the text. Verse 14, blessed are those who wash their robes. This is a 
reference to salvation, get saved, build your life on the Bible. It doesn't get any better than that. It doesn't, doesn't get any smarter than that. So this is the big idea of the text. As I mentioned, the blessing of God is on those who tremble at his word. Those people will not live under the curse. You say, you already said that. I know. I want you to remember it forever. We just think about that. This, in the morning when you get up and you're busy, wait a minute. Stop everything. Where is my Bible? I'm going to go out on the porch. I'm going to brew some tea. I'm just not going to rush off today. How many of you, don't raise your hand, you'd have to get up with those kids at camp and go, my Bible has been neglected. One girl, this was pretty sweet. She got up and she said, in chapel, that was my favorite testimony. In chapel, when, when Ken was telling those stories about, from the Bible, I realized that the Bible is an interesting book, and I haven't seen it as interesting. Well, yes, it's a, so interesting. It's more than interesting. It, and, and it, it yield, you, you, know, you know, you've had enough experience this way that the more you invest in understanding the Bible and in meditating on it, the more valuable, sweet it is to you, right? So, yeah, it's boring only when it's just sitting there. But then when you study it, like the ladies that buzz around here, I said, I said Thursday now, I think, or Friday, it's Friday, Thursday, Bible study fellowship ladies. You, you know, they're all like buzzing about Bibles. Like, it's so wonderful. And I, my first time I heard somebody talk about how much they love Bible study fellowship. I'm like, what do they do? Do they give out treats? It, what's up with Bible study? I mean, I'm preaching the Bible all my life. And uh, the ladies in the Bible study fellowship are all excited about Bible study. Like, what do they do? They have great lecturers. Not really, not necessarily. That's not the thing. What do you do? You know what I'm going to say, right? They go, we study the Bible. <laughs> we study the Bible. And they got a little trick to it. They study, they, they study the passage ahead of time, like you should be doing. They study the passage ahead of time, and they get the questions, and then they go and they have a small group where they talk about it. And then the lecturer is always interesting, even if they're not interesting, because you've been studying the Bible. Now, that's a program we ought to take to church. You study ahead of time, talk, get in a little group or, you know, with your wife or a prayer partner or meet some guys in the morning, some ladies, and, and small group, like in the Awana thing, uh, in the youth group, in the college group. And then, then you, you know, in big church, if you want to call it that, that when we talk about it, then maybe we'd be excited about Bible study again. There's a blessing on it. There's a blessing because you will take the promises and the warnings of God seriously. The notes in this are online if you want to see them at our church website, BethelJackson.org. You can see the notes for this. Second, you'll be blessed because you'll take worship seriously. I, John, verse 8, and the one who heard and saw these things, when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. <laughs> Could you imagine being there involved in that? John falls at the angel. He's always doing that. The angel's like, no, 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 you don't worship me. You worship him. He said to me, you must not do that. I am your fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets. And with those who keep the words of this book, worship God. What you, the thing that you put worth in, the thing that you recognize as worth is God. So why is it such a blessing to build your life on the Bible? Because you're blessed because you'll have the promises and warnings of God running in your heart. You'll take them seriously. You'll be blessed because you'll take worship seriously. A.W. Tozer has an interesting book I, I loved when I read when I was a boy called The Pursuit of God. And in it, he has a chapter called, which, which was so fresh to me as a kid, and read that, The Sacrament of Living, in which it was the first time I remember anybody really teaching me that you don't go to worship at church. That's not the only place you worship, but that you see life as a sacred thing, that all of life to a devout person. A person who builds their life on the Bible sees all of life as worship. That changes everything. That will help you. That will encourage you. You see God in everything. Eat whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do. Do all to the glory of God. And our, our worship is a humble response to God's revelation of himself. Could be in birdsong or the symmetry of a tree or the power of a storm or a newborn baby or a dear old man who's walked faithfully with God all of his life, and you can see the blessing of the Lord on his life and family. He said to me, verse 9, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant 
you and your brothers, the prophets, with those who keep the words of the book, you worship God, not me. Why are we blessed? We're blessed because we have the promises and warnings of God in our hearts. We're, we're blessed because the Bible drives us into worship. We're, third, we're blessed because we take the spreading of the word seriously. <laughs> Look at verse 10. He said to me, don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, which is interesting because earlier a prophecy is given said, seal it up and don't tell anybody. This is like, tell everybody. Don't seal this up. Don't keep this a secret. Tell all the kids that live along this road should get an invitation to hear about Jesus. I'm just kind of into that today. I'm just thinking as I drive, they're building more homes down this way. Hundreds of them. Oh, wouldn't it be something if we, I'm, I'm, I'm selling now, sorry, if we put together a team of 30 to 50 adults. I mean, this is probably a crazy ask. A, t- a team of 30 to 50 adults to prepare ourselves in case maybe some of the kids that live on our street would, would make their way. What if we went and got them? What if their parents said, okay? What if their parents came in? What in the world? That, I mean, it's a thought, right? It's, it, I know you've thought of it before. I just, I just think this is, the, this is what happens when we take the word seriously. You, you can never get far from who am I going to tell? I got to share this good news. This is the water of life. I got to share it with others. That's why it says that in verse 10, don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. My goodness, the time is near, he says. The time is near. Verse, look at verse 17. There's that invitation that we can be involved in. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let one who hears say, come. That's us. We should go say, come. Let the one who's thirsty, come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. That's our, that's our missionary task. You're not a follower of Jesus if you're not following him in his missionary heart, in his missionary task. And you can. We, we'll teach you how to do it. If you're confused about it, you think, well, my gifting is here or there. We'll show you how to use your gifting in, on a team that helps reach people that will actually get, some of them will actually get baptized right there. And they will follow Jesus right here. And some of them won't, but that's okay. And you can, you can get an assist in that. We can show you how to do that. Blessed because you spread the, take the spreading of the word. I, I heard this story. In, uh, in the deep south, there was a, there was a uh, Mordecai Ham was an evangelist coming through a, 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 an area of the deep south. And there was an old farmer there. Let's see, his name, I wrote it down, was Albert McMakin. Have you ever heard of Albert McMakin? Don't even know his name. So he's a farmer. And he's got these boys that work for him. And Mordecai Ham is going to set up a tent. And he wants these boys to get saved because they are not saved. And so he invites them to go hear Mordecai Ham, the revivalist evangelist at the tent. And the boys say, no, they're not interested. But this farmer, um, Albert McMakin, he had something that wasn't that common in that day. He owned a truck. He said to one of the ringleaders of the group, a boy named Billy, he said, Billy, if you go, I'll let you drive my truck and take these other friends of yours with you. And Billy Graham drove the truck to hear Mordecai I am. And my dad got saved because he read Billy Graham's book, Peace with God. So I'm glad that guy gave his truck to little Billy to take his friends to hear about Jesus. It doesn't, it doesn't get any more exciting than that. We have, at the end of the Bible, we have an offer to be involved in God's great missionary enterprise. It's inviting people to also drink of the water of life freely. How sweet is that? And I think that's why God gives us a spirit of adventure. I, I got to do something I wanted to do for 50 years this year. I, when I was a boy, my dad was a pastor in a group of churches that had three camps in a while. One was called Scioto Hills. One was called Skyview. The other was called Patmos. And I would look at the brochures of those camps and go, man, if I was a rich kid, I could go to one of those camps. One time my parents got the money together and sent me to Scioto Hills. Great experience. I learned to swim. My counselor got mad at me, threw me in. The girls were watching. I decided I got to swim. Uh, that's how I learned to swim. Uh, it was a great experience. Go to camp. You'll have a great time. Um, you, 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 anyway, uh, you know that I, 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 got to, I got to Patmos this week for the first time in 50 years. I took a ferry out there, put my car on a ferry, and went through the choppy waters to an island to preach. It's kind of like an adventure. And I told the kids, you're so lucky. You're so blessed. It took me 50 years to get here. 
And they actually gave me money, you know, not a ton, but, you know, some, and free food and a beautiful room overlooking the lake. And I got to preach over and over again. It's like an adventure. I told the kids, you know, God did not give you a spirit of adventure so that you could jump off bridges. He, I mean, that's fun, but that's not the main reason. He didn't give you a spirit of adventure so you could just, you know, go around the world and see all the sights and buy the trinkets that were made in China and you could have some for yourself. He gave you a spirit of adventure because your job is to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. It might even be bold to take the gospel somewhere here in Jackson, just to a new neighborhood or to a new family. It might even be scary. Fourth, reviewing, number one. We're blessed because we take the promises and warnings seriously, verses 6 and 7. We're blessed because we take worship seriously, verses 8 and 9. We're blessed because we take spreading the word seriously, verses 10 and 17. We're blessed because we take self-examination seriously. You can't miss this in verse 11. Let the evil, evil doer do evil still, the filthy still be filthy, the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. I'm coming soon, bringing my recompense with me. To repay each one for what he has done. This would be unbelievers. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. You can't tremble at the word without taking personal self-examination seriously. A boy came to me after chapel and he, he says to me, sometimes my faith gets cold. What should I do? I said, do you ever sin? He's like, not, not a lot. That's what you're supposed to say to the camp speaker. Not a lot. So I started going through the list just to help him out. You know how we do. Pastors are good at this. You know, did you ever take something that wasn't yours? Well, yeah. Did you ever say something that wasn't true? Yeah. You probably never lusted. Yeah. I thought so. I thought so. And you ever take the Lord's name in vain? You know, I said, here's what the, one of the ways to get close to the Lord is to think about your sin and think deeply about that you deserve to die and go to hell. And there's no good thing in your flesh. But Jesus came and rescued you, gave you his Holy Spirit so that you could begin to live a holy life. That always helps me. So I would say, you know, go back and remember your sin, but don't forget about what Jesus did and that he sent his Holy Spirit. You take self-examination seriously if you take the Bible seriously. And, and then number five, bless it, you're blessed because you live looking up. You live looking up. You, you don't look at the circumstances of this world all the time. You look at the promises of God. Listen to this now, verse 16. And I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I'm the root, the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit of the bride say, come. The one who hears say, come. Let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who's thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take of the water of life without price, I warn you, everyone. That's, that is, uh, you, you're living, if you take the word seriously, you'll live looking up. You'll take, that's one of the reasons why we did the whole series on Revelation. is so we think in concrete terms about heaven and hell. Just simple, thoughtful, are we ready? And then there's, again, there's an invitation that I just read. There's also a serious warning in verses 18 and 19. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in the book. If anyone takes away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life in the holy city, which are described in this book. Whether or not you fully understand that, that, that's some serious warning. You don't mess with the Bible. You don't reinterpret the Bible according to what you think. You, you trust God and you build your life on God's word. You have promises and you have warnings. You have here you have an invitation from Jesus and you have a warning from Jesus. And there's a final reminder in verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, surely I'm coming soon. And the response in the antiphonal response, amen, come Lord Jesus. Come, come and get us. It, Vance Havner was an old Southern Baptist evangelist and he said when he was a boy in school, he was bad at math until he discovered that all the answers are in the back of the book. That's how they used to roll. So he said, if I ever got confused or stumped, I just turned to the back of the book and I looked at the answer. That's what, he said, that's what Christians should do. If you ever get confused or disoriented 
or you don't know the answer, just turn to the back of the book where it says, he who testifies of these things says, surely I'm coming soon. And that's going to iron a lot of things out if you live looking up like that. And let me show you the last word of the Bible. This is very interesting. Verse 21, the last word of the Bible. Do you realize that the word grace is the last word of the Bible? Gift. God wants to gift you. This is what it says. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. I just want to give to you. I just want to gift you. I just want to indulge you. That's what God is saying. If you, if you, if you believe my son Jesus, build your life on the word of God. It'll just be me giving. I tell a story at camp I've told you before. I always tell it to a group I speak to for the first time. A little story about the little boy that wouldn't reach in to get the candy, but he let the proprietor fill his hands with candy. And on the way out, his dad says, why didn't you reach in? And he says, because his hands are bigger than mine. And I always tell the kids, God's hands are bigger than yours. God's plans are better than yours. God is leaning forward in his heaven to bless you. He wants to bless you. And he says, this is how it works. You receive my son, Jesus. You build your life on my book. I'll pour out a blessing. We've asked one of our elders, Mike Vanderwalker, to come. And Mike's going to come right now because we want to bless you. We want you to go on your way with an official blessing. So would you stand to your feet? And we want to conclude our service today with Mike sharing whatever's on his heart and then sharing a blessing for you. Thank you, Mike.